Inkedink, 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 Wow! Limerick or two? I didn't know you wrote poetry, Basil. Yeah, you do? Okay. Well, okay, you're going to have to tell me the poem, and what I'll do is I'll have to um, then tell it to the audience. And do you want me to do like I did last week and uh, actually say, actually make the sounds that you make about what your, your poetry, your poem is, to actually tell, me, tell the poem in, in your actual language, your native language, your, your birth language, cat, um, as opposed to um, your adopted language and, uh, well, some people would say made-up language, Catanese. Now, you adopted that from Cantonese, or, or that's what he's been telling me. But, um, yeah, he says he wants to actually, me to actually quote him in cat. He's going to tell me the poem. I'll quote it to you in cat, and then I'll actually read the poem. Okay? Okay. Um, this is his first limerick. Okay? Okay. Which goes something like this in cat. Okay, did I get that right? Okay. Now, I'll translate that into English for the benefit of the audience members that have not yet learned to speak Catanese. And Basil's saying, you kids, you need to learn to speak my language because there's more of me in the United States then there are all the Italians put together. There's more cats in American households than uh, all uh, Germans put together, all Ecuadorians put together, all uh, Portuguese put together. He says, he's got you all beat. He says he knows you Irish folks speak sort of a modified English, but uh, for all purpose sake, certainly there are more cats in American households than there are, are Irish people. And I think that's probably pretty safe to say. I mean, um, how about Puerto Ricans? Yeah, he says, yep, there's more, more cats in America in households than Puerto Ricans. So, therefore, he thinks it's incumbent upon the audience and Americans in general, people living in America, to learn to speak cat, so at least you can keep up with what's going on in your... Um, in your, in your house cat's uh, life. Okay. So uh, you wanted me just to repeat that. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. And in English it goes something like this. There once was a monster Godzilla who ate 20 tons of vanilla. He spit on New York, the heck with those dorks, and lots of blood he did spilla. Okay. That kind of how it went? Okay. Oh, okay. He's answering me. Okay. Yep, yep. Mm hmm. Meow. Meow. Which translated is, yep, okay. So, um, are you you're anticipating, I guess, some call-ins as we discuss these um, these movie picks? Um, now, I noticed that one of them you wanted to choose actually isn't here. You wanted to choose at a movie that went by the name of that goes by the name of Snatch. And no, it's not, not as you might anticipate. 
Um, Snatch, which has become one of Basil's uh, all-time favorites, actually takes place um, mostly in England. And it's about the theft of an 86-carat diamond. About the size of a small fist. Pretty good-sized diamond. And Basil won't tell you much about the movie other than the fact that it has a couple little vignettes in it that are just a howl, he says. Um, one of the vignettes involves one of the characters in the film, Mickey, who's pay, played by Basil's, one of Basil's favorite actors, Brad Pitt. And uh, Mickey is, well, we can use the term. He's a pikey, which is another term the British use for gypsy. And of course, you know, gypsies are not very well regarded anywhere in America. They're uh, in America or, or Europe or anywhere. They're really treated very badly. They're really um, talked about in, in the most unfriendly of terms. Anyway, so um, the gypsies in this film are actually doing some work. They're actually selling, uh, selling some, um, in the process of selling a couple of uh, uh, motor homes to, um, to two of the characters in the film. And they, um, they have a conversation amongst themselves. And apparently, their language, which is kind of a, kind of a variation of, of English, the British, the British language, um, is pretty much indecipherable. And they do this intentionally so that when they're in negotiation with anybody, on any subject or any matter, and they're talking amongst themselves, the people that they're negotiating with have no idea what they're saying. So they can carry on a discussion amongst themselves. And, uh, okay, Basil wants me to, uh, to deliver the famous line. Okay. Do you like dags? Okay, and Basil, Basil says he's not not real fond, obviously, as you know on the show, from watching the show, you know Basil's not real fond of dogs. But the gypsies in their negotiations with different uh, characters in the process in the movie always seem to sweeten the deal by throwing in a dog, usually the same dog, who is taken as part of the deal, and eventually runs home, back home to the gypsies so they can, uh, they can throw him in as a sweetener in, in the next deal. So anyway, so um, obviously nobody knows that when the gypsies say dags, that they really mean dogs. Okay. Well, anything else you want to mention about um, Snatch as being interesting? Says, yeah, there's a great, there's a great um, heist of the diamond in the beginning of the film. Um, there are um, five gentlemen to go into a, a diamond, a diamond uh, store, a diamond, uh, a diamond store, uh, dressed as rabbis. Basically, they've got the rabbi, rabbinical costumes on, and they and they go in and they um, and they and they get in there and end up um, conducting conducting a, a theft. And that's how the movie begins. Uh, Benicio del, del Toro, marvelous. Everybody, Dennis Farina. Did I miss anybody? I said you missed a lot of folks. He said, but there's a, it's a great movie. The name of the movie is Snatch. Basil highly recommends it. Now, you have some other ones here that you included, you brought with us, Basil. Um, we want to start with um, the two New York movies, the two feel-good movies about, uh, about New York City and its uh, everyday existence and mundane happenings. Okay, yeah. First thing, first one we want to recommend, Basil wants to recommend, and I will too. That's a good movie. A movie named Cloverfield. Cloverfield takes place in New York City. A bunch of uh, young professionals are having a party for one of them that's, uh, that's taken a job, as it turns out, in Japan. And so he, they're having a going away party. And in the midst of all this party, just your new normal New York City ruckus occurs. Um, there's a giant explosion down in New York Harbor. The, um, the head of the Statue of Liberty comes bouncing through the streets past their, uh, past their neighborhood. And um, they're down in uh, Alphabet City um, in lower Manhattan. Um, 
all kinds of fun events. And the movie is shot, if you remember the Blair Witch Trials, where the movie is shot essentially in its entirety by a movie camera, by a handheld movie camera. This movie um, follows that same, uh, the same pattern of, of um, narration. Uh, the folks take a camera to uh, record going away messages for the young man who's um, taking the job as a vice president for a company over in Japan, and uh, they're recording everybody's going away messages to him. Um, in doing that, they're, they end up recording that's this event that takes place where there's a giant explosion in, uh, down in New York Harbor, um, all kinds of horrible things transcend on the city that evening, all kinds of monsters, ghouls, all kinds of stuff. There's usual stuff in New York City. And uh, it's well, well, it's creative. It um, overlaps and underlaps two events which have been taped on the same tape in this camera. One with the two of the principal characters and uh, it cuts away as it's taped over for the, the main chain of events that happened on uh, the evening a month later. And uh, then bits and pieces of the, uh, the other event pop up every time the, uh, the cameras shut off for a moment or uh, pause for a moment. You have this overlapping, and it's, it's a good movie. And uh, Dazzle thinks it's um, well worth your time. That's Cloverfield. Okay. Now, you want to go down to um, New York Harbor, down to South Street Seaport again, and we'll talk about uh, Godzilla? Okay. Basil says that Godzilla, well, he'll go along with, the, um, with a little uh, note on the front of the package of this DVD. Size does matter. Basil uh, thinks that's pretty appropriate. Basil particularly likes the opening of the movie. He says that the opening of the movie, and I want to get this accurately, says the opening of the movie, which shows some of the events which led up to Godzilla's emergence, some atomic testing in the South Pacific for decades. Um, he thinks that that's, and it's done in, uh, in red tones, so it, it conveys that, uh, that, that notion, as red normally does, a notion of fear and, uh, and horror. And, and Basil thinks that that's pretty, pretty effective, it's pretty effective cinematography. Um, thinks that the, the tone of the movie is very different from the other Godzilla movie. Uh, but he thinks this one is, is not, as, not as simple in nature, not as straightforward, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a good flick, and he recommends it. He doesn't want me to tell you too much more about it than that, other than, um, other than Basil's favorite... Okay, Basil's, Basil's got a fondness for earthworms, and earthworms play very heavily into this movie. You'll just have to watch it to find out how. Okay. Okay. Now here's one that Bas one of Basil's all-time favorites. This is from way before he was born. This is back from um, the early 1970s. Oh, okay, hold on, oh, hold on, hold on. Basil Buddha Cat presents. Basil, it's, it's a fellow by the name of Vincent. Okay, name sounds familiar. Do you know anybody named Vincent Basil? Okay, Vincent says that he actually invented the notion of movie picks, of picking movies and uh, recommending them. And Vincent's picks still stand, he says, as one of the, uh, one of the great ways to weed through movies. Not only classics, but also ones as they come out. Vincent, he's pretty, um, he's pretty adamant that um, his... Um, well, you know, we're just trying to... Basil's going to just try to to do his own, uh, his own movie recommendation shtick. And he's going to, we'll wing it and see how it goes. And uh, after you watch the show, maybe you want to call back in and give us some suggestions for our second show. Because you know we do a Sunday morning show. And a Sunday morning show, Basil Budacat Presents, generally has more of a religious tone to it. So, um, okay. 
Okay, so we'll, we'll look forward to talking to you after the show and, and perhaps at the beginning of the next show. Thanks for calling. Okay. Now, I don't remember exactly where, we, where we've heard of Vincent's picks from, but, um, huh, okay. All righty. What? Okay. Another call in. Good evening, Basil Buddha Cat presents. Really? Basil? Are you expecting a call from Julia Louis Dreyfus? No, she says it's not Julia Louis Dreyfus. For the purpose of this call, it's actually Elaine Bennis. Okay. Now, that name we recognize because actually Basil and I were looking at a magazine prior to, prior to the show going on. It's a magazine that was uh, put out in special recognition of the last episode of Seinfeld. It's got a synopsis of all the Seinfeld uh, shows, um, all of which Basil and I have watched um, numerous times. Oh, okay. Um, so, Ju- oh, um, Elaine. Okay. Um, do you have a comment for, uh, for Basil? Any, any notes on any, um, any movies? Okay. <laughs> she says that um, Vincent, Vincent's picks was probably, in her estimation, the biggest waste of time, packet of cigarettes, carton of cigarettes, a bottle of whiskey, a necklace, and, well, we don't want to talk about that in, on the air, but um, she says that uh, Vincent's uh, picks was actually, in, in her estimation, a big waste of time, and uh, she would not recommend Vincent's picks as being noteworthy. So she's wishing us luck. She's hoping that we, um, that we do, a, do a nice job with our show, and we appreciate that very much, uh, Elaine. Thanks for calling. Okay. She said you expected her to call in. Okay, that's nice of you to keep that from me. Okay, at any rate, um, here's one that's certainly one of the uh, classic movies of all time, especially for the month of July and August. Jaws. Basil has um, taken great pleasure in watching this uh, this movie, although, although Basil says there's, there's a cult classic out that makes marvelous, marvelous fun, spoofs in a very marvelous way this, uh, this well-made uh, movie, Jaws. It's called Claws. And uh, Basil doesn't want to uh, go into detail about that one because he thinks it's, it's, it's worth a look-see, but he wants to recommend that one. Now go on and recommend this one, Jaws. Now, what particularly do you like about the movie? What strikes you as being... Okay, he says he likes... He thinks uh, the other Dreyfus, Richard Dreyfus, no relationship to Julia Louis Dreyfus. Uh, Richard Dreyfus is, in fact, one of his uh, favorite, en- uh, favorite entertainers of all time. He's, he really enjoys the movies with Richard Dreyfus in it. He says... Um, he says... His characters are whimsical, serious, everything you can imagine. And that's in the same movie. Okay. Now, we may get back to this one later. Okay. Um, okay, another, another couple of movies that have Brad Pitt in them. Okay. 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 Here's one that's a real surprise. Very intriguing movie. But it goes by the name of Fight Club. Now, Basil, um, like me, you're not a very big fan of um, the sweet science, as it's called, pugilism, fighting, boxing, fist fighting. But you found this one to be interesting. Now, without telling too much about the movie, what do you describe about this movie as being... Um, as being um, 
fascinating. Or, as the, of course, the, uh, the words on the back of say, mind-blowing, bold, bruising humor, savagely funny. Okay, yep. Basil says that Fight Club, which has a subplot, subtitled Mischief, Mayhem, and Soap. And Soap plays prominently into uh, some of the later scenes in the movie. At any rate, um, it involves a young man who meets another young man, and their lives are, are humdrum, and uh, they find an outlet for their off, off work hours. Something they call Fight Club, where a lot of young men come and join and, and get involved in, in fist fighting and uh, learn rule number one is never talk about Fight Club outside of Fight Club. Um, any uh, kudos for Edward Norton, who's also in the movie? He says his character is basically just a shadow of Brad Pitt's character. Okay. Or is it the other way around? He says, no. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt's the character. Norton is just the sub-character, the shadow character. All right, so um, you give that a big, uh, big thumbs up, Basil? Okay. Okay. One more movie to discuss. And that also has Brad Pitt in it. And it goes by the name of Ocean's Eleven, which, as you know, is a remake of a movie which, in, in its original form, had uh, the Brat Pack in it. Uh, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford. Uh, pretty interesting movie about um, a big theft and uh, the consequences of that theft. Okay, okay. Basil Budokat presents. Basil, it's... Tweety, could you double check? We have the, the number we have on. Could you see if you could trace this, uh, this number back to a fellow by the name of Edward Norton? Okay. No, that's not Ed Norton. That's Edward Norton. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Tweety... Oh, okay, Tweety says yes. Yes, in fact, the call traces back to the cell phone number of Edward Norton. Okay. Do um, you have a comment? Okay, Edward Norton says that Fuyan Alias, Brad Pitt's character, is a shadow of my character. Really? Okay. Okay, well, um, that's intriguing. I mean, within the, uh, within the realm of movie making, certainly, certainly a little, um, a little friendly, uh, little friendly uh, argument uh, can certainly play out well. Okay, do you have anything else to add, uh, Mr. Norton? It says call him Ed. Okay. Hold on. Basil, what? Oh, I can't say that on television. Okay. We'll have to, um, we'll have to see if this one passes the censors and maybe we, can, uh, maybe we can fit it in onto our Sunday morning show. Basil's got another little limerick about Brad Pitt and Ed, Ed Norton, Edward Norton, and he's... Um, Pretty insistent. Okay, now, he what? He says you sent him a copy of the limerick and sent a copy of the limerick also to, uh, to Brad Pitt. Okay, okay. And it's not just a, not just a limerick. He says it's actually an ode. So it's, it's a long form, 32 stanza ode to Brad Pitt and Edward Norton. Okay, you know what I'll do? I'll do Basil, what I'll do so the cats that are watching can, um, can hear this 32 stanza ode to Brad Pitt and Ken Norton. I'm gonna repeat it. Go ahead, you tell it to me. Oh, hold on, Mr. Norton. Okay. Okay, 32 stanza, oh. Okay. Okay. Here you go, kids out there who, uh, who speak uh, cat. Mm. Okay. Got that? Okay. 
Okay, now did you get your version in Cat or did you get your version in, um, in English? He says he got it in English, thank you very much, Basil. And uh, he'll take that up with you at a later date. Okay, thank you for calling in. Uh, we may fit this into our Sunday morning show. But uh, thanks for calling. Okay. Hello? No, it's, it's Edward Norton again. No, um, we're actually going to have to um, continue with our discussion. The movies. We have one more movie to touch on, and that is not one that you are in. So it's pretty imperative that we get, uh, that, we get that, one, uh, that one involved. So um, we'll see if we can talk to you perhaps on the Sunday morning show. Thanks for calling. Okay. Tweety says there's a busy signal, but now, hold on. Actually went, I actually started two minutes late. I got the, I got the clock, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Station managers. Okay, um, hello, this is the Basil Budicat Presents. Okay. Basil, it's Brad Pitt. Uh, yes, um, would you prefer we call you uh, Brad or Mr. Pitt? He says, you can call him back later, Basil, because... Whatever Edward Norton said goes double for him. Okay. Okay, we'll see if we can maybe continue this discussion. Uh, he also says he's got a limerick for you that's 198 stanzas long. So that sounds pretty prolific. Okay, you want me to put that? Okay, I'm, go I'm going to actually I see it on the teleprompter, and I'm going to translate that onto Basil in, um, in Cat. Hold on. Okay, Basil, here comes 198 stanza limerick from Brad Pitt. Mm. Ha! Basil ears are twitching and his uh, whiskers are flickering. Okay, thanks for calling. Okay, one quick one. One last one on this morning's show. Ocean's Eleven. Now, that also has Brad Pitt in it. It's got a fine cast of characters. George Clooney, Matt Damon, Amy, Andy Garcia, Julia Roberts. Um amongst others, a uh, pretty, good, pretty good flick. Now, what did you like in particular about this movie, Basil? Basil says the entire operation was actually masterminded by, uh, by a cat. And uh, because of that, he says um, two very big paws up for Ocean's Eleven, Eleven. but uh, with that, we're going to have to break off and uh, we'll come back and do a Sunday morning show, and uh, this has been Basil Wooded Cat Presents. I'm David Stevenson, uh, Basil's co-host, uh, interpreter, and chief gopher, and Basil Wooded Cat. Thanks. Enjoy your evening. They say they'd rob your grandma blind on Wall Street, on Wall Street. Fritter her, her away her Medicare on Wall Street. And pharma oil and their pet fox don't care if she lives in a box. So long as they wear platinum jocks on Wall Street, on Wall Street. Meow. audiences to get something out of our show to